Welcome to a Parallel Project Training APM Project Fundamentals Qualification Podcast based on the APM Body of Knowledge 7th edition. You should be using this in conjunction with our e-learning, podcasts and potentially a tutor-led course. For more information please visit www.parallelprojecttraining.com Okay, and welcome to another Parallel Project Training podcast. This is based on the Body of Knowledge 7th edition, and um, this particular podcast is for if you're studying the Project Fundamentals qualification. Um, but feel free to listen, um, even if you're not studying towards that qualification. So my name is Michelle Greaves, and with me today is Jan Underdown. So hello, Jan. Hello there, Michelle. Thank you for joining me today to talk about scope and scope management. Um, so we've got um, quite a few bits to cover in here. So the assessment criteria that we're going to be covering are um, define scope management, differentiate between scope management in linear projects and scope management in iterative projects, And then we'll move on to how product and work breakdown structures are used to um, help us define the scope. And then we'll finish off with um, outline how a project manager would use cost breakdown structures, organisation breakdown structures and the responsibility assignment matrix. So lots of acronyms coming in. Lots yes, of lots to cover. Words. Yes. Um, so let's let's start with the the scope then. So before we do scope management, um, let's start with what a scope actually is. What do we mean by that? Yes, uh, scope it, it can be described in different ways, but basically scope is what the project will deliver. It's it's the entirety of what it will actually deliver. So say for example, um, you know, if we deliver a training course, the scope would actually include all the handouts, the materials, the exercises, and may include as organising the venue and the exams and stuff like that. So so how much work? What is the entirety of the work? And of course, it can actually, it, it first gets described in terms of the business case. Um, mm. So we may be offshoring our administration within Thailand, for example. So that's the main scope. But what we need to do then do is to actually start to break that down into different different ways. Mm. And why is it important for us to define the scope on our projects? So we understand the extent of it. Also, mm. it's important not just to um, explain what's included in the project, but also what is not inclu- included. Absolutely. Yes, in, in, in my experience, it can actually have some horror stories where the, the client is expecting a lot more than what you've actually delivered. Yes. So we need to manage their expectations. And if it's not clear at the start, then it's very easy for things to kind of sidle their way into your projects. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also uh, within another podcast, podcast, we talk about change control because scope is also baselined mm. um, as we come out of definition of the project in the project management plan. And then we need to watch that people don't, you know, secretly add on stuff as well, that we actually end up with a scope creep. Mm. So scope management is, um, scope I should say, is what's in the project. So what's scope management then? It's managing that that particular area. We can actually break those down into um, um, defined pieces or elements. And then we need to manage them through the project in terms of the work that's encompassed to actually deliver the scope. Mm. And also, we mentioned before about change control, is that if changes are made to the scope, we actually manage that effectively. Mm. And we can actually challenge what, ad, what value does that, that, that um, new element add to the scope. Mm. So we've been very clear about what we're delivering. Yeah, because that would then um, develop into the output of the project would actually then deliver the benefits. So the thing that can help us um, manage our scope are um, quite often we use breakdown structures. Yes. So could you talk us through product and work breakdown structures? Absolutely, love a good breakdown. I actually still work this way in, in myself, especially product breakdown structures. Um, is actually getting the output of the project and breaking it down into its elements. Uh, very often do this when we're actually developing uh, programmes for organisations, um, is to actually have the top level part of the product and also what it's trying to, uh, trying to actually deliver, maybe the, the outline of the programme, and then break it down into its elements. So, for example, you may have a lot of the tutor, su- tutor support elements Um, So take another analogy, like your car, you actually have the car, you can describe the car, it's a 
a model um, X, Y, and Z of a rover, for example. But that rover will be broken down into elements. It actually has the actual body shape and also the fittings to the body shape. It will actually have the engine and what the makeup of the engine actually is. It'll have the wheels and the axle and the tires. So we can actually break those things down into maybe groupings of products. Mm -hmm. And we may actually provide identifiers of those, those particular products as well. And that will start to, to actually go into your identification of configuration management, which again will be talked about within another podcast. Mm -hmm. So it's understanding the, the actual breaking it down into its different elements as well to get to the detail. Mm -hmm. And of course, that will then also lead on into requirements and quality aspects of what it needs to comply with. So when we break down a, a product in our product breakdown structure, how many levels should, should we get it, to? It depends. Whatever level is, is kind of necessary. If you're going to buy something in, then you would just quote, I need an XYZ model or something, yeah. because it will actually have its own descriptor. Yeah. But to get to a level of understanding, really, you don't need to break down like a tyre into the different materials of the tyre. You just want... Yeah that type of tyre with that type of tread on it, perhaps. Don't want too much level of detail, no. do we? You know, probably three or four is kind of quite common, isn't it? Yes, it and is. You combine them together. So what's a work breakdown structure in comparison to a product breakdown structure? So the products, we actually identified uh, what we need to build and what's actually included in terms, in terms of the products. The work breakdown structure looks at the activities the work is going to be undertaken. Typically, a work breakdown structure may be um, defined in terms of work streams. So you might have an engineering um, you know, breakdown, a work stream. Uh, you might actually have an IT work stream or, or depending what the business may be, a HR kind of work stream. And that will break the work down into its activities. And ultimately, you may get to a level, what we call the work package or mm -hmm. task level, is when we delegate those tasks to people to undertake the work. So they're very, very clear about what is it they're trying to create, maybe have the specification from the product breakdown structure of what they've got to build, the quality criteria. Also, you may be handing down to them timescales, any sort of budget uh, requirements and any constraints they have to work within. Mm. Uh, and of course, those tasks uh, may be within internal teams, but also may be subcontracted out um, through suppliers, which will be then uh, discussed in procurement as well. So if our product breakdown structure for the car was um, like the engine and yes. the wheels, then the work breakdown structure would be about... All the engineering tasks to actually put, build the engine, mm. absolutely. So you end up at the end of that with the product. So there's kind of a link between product and work breakdown yes. structure. Yes. But most organisations, there's a few organisations use the term product breakdown. I, I, I find that very useful for my thinking yeah. to understand because sometimes you may miss out elements of the scope that I have to deliver. Mm. And also you may include things which are external. I don't deliver them, but I have to use them. Like, for example, we're doing the PFQ right now. We have to use a syllabus and the learning outcomes, which is an external product, but we have to use it to build the programme. Mm. External product. Yeah. But we don't have to use both either, do no, we? No, we don't. We um, lots of people use pure work breakdown structures, yeah. for example, or, or a variant of that. And then once we get to the level of the tasks or work package, then in another podcast we talk about scheduling. Mm. You know, putting these that's in a, the next in a, step, isn't it? That's right. Put these in an order, a logic order, to actually build build the product through the scheduling. And I, I think that's a good point to remember, actually, on a product or a work breakdown structure, there's there's not a logical order or dependencies in tasks. It's not looking at that. All we're trying to do is show what we're delivering, what's in scope. Yes. And if it's not on the breakdown structure, it's out of scope. But we yes. then put them into the order when we go into our scheduling. Uh, absolutely. And this is really useful to work in teams uh, of post-it notes on the wall. Fantastic. Yeah. Then we take that bottom level develop the logic network into the schedule. Absolutely. So we've got a couple more breakdown structures. We've got the cost breakdown structure, CBS, and the organisation breakdown structure, the OBS. So can you talk us through those in comparison then? <laughs> yeah, so you're gonna, the actual uh, cost breakdown structure is really looking at the cost profile of the project. Yeah. Um, and often you'll see this on projects, especially if, if those of you are actually filling out timesheets, you often have to put your time or certain costs to different cost centres mm. and how they're kind of broken down. So it's really understanding that particular element. And they can actually be broken down in various different ways. An example in the book, we have things like labour type mm. costs, and we have material costs and we have this thing called overheads, mm. the danger yeah. 
Yeah. And we need to understand, and are we directly um, charged the overheads or a percentage, or is it not included? And also the things you have to really watch are things like travel and expenses, that we yeah. actually manage those. So it's often uh, around the cost centre codes, and, and organisations usually have the defined way of actually explaining or, or defining how you're going to do your, your cost. But it's getting a good profile, and you can actually go into a bit more depth about re- reoccurring costs, one-off costs, all of that, but that's not for this particular type of syllabus here. Yeah. And you could do a cost breakdown structure simply on a product breakdown structure. Absolutely. So the costs associated with each of your products. Products, yes. Mm. Yes, I quite like the breakdown structures because you're actually looking at the, the scope of the project in what I call different lenses. Yeah. From the products you've got to build to the work we've got to do about the costs yeah. aspect. And also the next one we're talking about is the organisation. Um, in terms of the skill sets, the competence, the suitably qualified experienced people, the squebs as we call them. Yes. <laughs> it's like something out of Star Trek, isn't it? Or Harry Potter. Even. Oh, yeah, squebs. That'd be quite <laughs> cool. Yes. And that brings us to the organisational breakdown structure. And this is really fully describing the teams. This is quite useful at the beginning of the project. So with the car, you know, what type of engineers are we going to need? Yeah. We're going to need electrical engineers, mechanical engineers. We're going to need designers, perhaps, who's going to design new aspects of the car. Um, we're going to need testing people, and they may have to be qualified testers. Mm. Um, what skill sets are we going to need? Are these actually kind of available? And also what the organisational breakdown structure, it gives us the reporting lines, the hierarchy of the project too. But this is um, project related, so lots of organisations yes. will have their org charts, and we're not really talking about that here. No, are we? we're not. It's just specifically to the the project and who's going to talk to who. So not line management. Who needs to communicate with who, Absolutely. and who do we need as well? Yes, and also the reporting lines as well. When you talk about reporting um, in another podcast. Mm. So um, our, our last one, um, not quite a breakdown structure now. We've got the, the RAM or often called the RACI chart, Responsibility yes. Assignment Matrix. Yes, there's so. different variants of, of RAMs, Responsibility mm. Assignment Matrix, uh, and RACI is one of the most common we actually see. So there are different variants. And the RACI stands for um, the R is Responsible. Mm-hmm. A is accountable, C is consult, and I is informed. It's a combination of two of the breakdown structures we've had just talked about right now. From the organisational breakdown structure, uh, where we've actually defined the different roles and the different uh, competences, and the work breakdown structure, which is, defines the work packages or the tasks. Mm-hmm. And so what we're doing, they're really, really useful because it really does um, identify responsibility and accountability. Mm-hmm. So to explain that, for example... Um, if Michelle wanted me to actually organise a workshop for her team, mm. um, I would be responsible for developing and maybe delivering the workshop. Michelle would be accountable as part of the organisation to make sure it's been done effectively. Yeah. We maybe have to consult with other HR training departments, so then you may want to actually put other people on here. Uh, we may have to keep uh, people informed, like the security or the um, you know, the facilities management. The people that are going to go. The people well. that are going to go, yeah. absolutely. And so that really defines that. Um, and so, and also, uh, you can actually look on your chart, and if you're responsible for three major work packages, do I actually have the capacity to do that? Yes. And also, they're quite good for defining account- accountability. Mm. So, Michelle, I thought you were going to do that. And you yeah. may argue, no, I'm not. Actually, on our lovely chart here, yeah, you are down to do it. You're responsible. Mm. So responsibility is about the doing, isn't it? Whereas the yes. accountability, I might delegate the, the actual responsibility, the doing of it to somebody, but I'm still going to retain the accountability. Ability, yes, yes. Absolutely. So really, so getting a, a lot of use these days, mm. it gives that granularity around the roles and responsibilities too. Yeah, so we we get our RAM from our OBS and from our WBS. Right. Just to put in some nice acronyms Acronyms for us. Remember what we're talking about. You might like it. Um, that's great and and that they're all really good tools to help us define our scope and then starting to move us towards assigning um, the tasks to the people involved yes um, now I haven't forgotten this one of the assessment criteria that we need to cover um, which is about differentiating between scope management how it's done in linear projects and how it's done in iterative projects yes so let's start with linear how might we manage scope in a, a linear project well linear is we could um, inverted commas called 
support the traditional type of project management approach. And of course, scope is, is first identified perhaps in the business case, and then certainly within definition, and it's, it's the fundamental part of unpacking the business case into the project management plan. Mm-hmm. Once we get the scope sorted out, then it actually triggers an awful lot of other activities mm-hmm. in terms of um, you know the costs and the organisational breakdowns, the, the work packages, the schedule, etc., Okay, so it's quite so defined. It's very it? defined, usually baselined at that yeah. point. Now, in an iterative, um, scope is a flexible part. The, the time scales and the costs are usually defined. Mm. And then you actually can flex the scope as we go through each of the iterations. Usually use iterative uh, when we're trying to build up capability and often we're talking in terms of outcomes. So we may not fully understand what the scope actually is. So within the first iteration, we may be doing modelling or prototyping um, and what we need to come out of, of the first iteration is a minimal usable subset. Mm-hmm. So within um, a scope management, we use the term Moscow. It's not, so, it's not a, a Russian term. It's, <laughs> it's how we define or prioritise scope. Mm-hmm. So the Moscow stands for must, minimal usable subset. It mm-hmm. needs to work. It doesn't need to be pretty or anything like that. Should, it's not as important as must, but we may not get all we, in terms of the, the functionality. Could is a flexible if we actually are working uh, really well within the time and cost elements, then we could actually pr- uh, do these bits. And W is want. Mm-hmm. We won't get this. It actually clearly defines this is out of scope. It's another way of showing what's on our breakdown structure, isn't it? The, yes. The must is what's on our work breakdown structure. What isn't on there is the won't. That is the won't bit, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And then the, the, actually the teams then work with the must. We need to get these things done to actually have the minimal usable subset. So take the car, for example. We need to have the basics of the car. Yeah. It could be a wooden cardboard box, a wooden box yeah. with a couple of pram wheels on. Yeah. Needs, it needs wheels, but it doesn't um, need a hi-fi and a, um, no. a CD player. Most of them don't have CD players nowadays, do they? No, you're talking old school here now. Yeah, <laughs> showing my age there. Okay, so yeah, so that's and then the, the, the actual changes come through of each iterations, and of course the scope will change mm. and then reprioritised. So perhaps the product and work breakdown structures in an iterative would look slightly different. Absolutely, absolutely. Although you can use elements prioritisation within scope in, in traditional linear projects as well. Mm-hmm. So we've st- talked about scope and scope management, and we've gone through some different breakdown structures and, and mm-hmm. kind of given a bit more detail on um, on some requirements, which is almost getting into your, your project management qualifications, slightly higher level there. Um, but the key things there to remember here are about what scope is and those different breakdown structures yes. um, and that our scope is going to be defined in a linear project mm-hmm. whereas in a, an iterative project it's going to be a bit more flexed and there's going to be more yes it'd be prioritized yes using our moscow there right oh, that's really interesting thank you so much for that jan we hope you enjoyed this podcast and found it informative To find out about our training courses, e-learning or tutor-led course, please go to www.parallelprojecttraining.com.